We will begin with uh, Amy Hogopian. You had a maybe. Did you want to testify? Okay. So we can do it this way. You can either do it standing in front or. Shouldn't I face the yeah. audience? You okay. can do it standing in front or sitting there. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Hogopian. I am on the faculty in public health at the University of Washington. Um, I'm not prepared to talk about the technical side of this, but I would like to say that I have been following Hanford for decades, um, living in Seattle since 1972. And it seems to me there have been some consistent voices, organizations, the Hanford Advisory Board, Hanford Challenge, Heart of America Northwest, uh, that have been right on these issues over time. And it seems to me the benefit of the doubt should go to their advice. Next we have Jim Thomas. And just to remind you, just to state your name, please. My name is Jim Thomas. I reside here in Seattle. I want to thank the Department of Ecology for holding tonight's hearing. I'm very concerned with DOE, US DOE, wanting to grout tunnel number two. Ecology seems ready to acquiesce and allow grouting soon. I wonder why US DOE and Ecology did not detect sooner the ongoing deterioration of both Purex tunnels, rather than forcing this emergency mode scramble. I also wonder how many more toxic threats will take us by surprise before Hanover cleanup is managed in such a way as to assure protection of the environment, public health, and taxpayer funds. Some of the tunnel waste is very radioactive. It should not remain in shallow burial at Hanford. In my nearly 35 years of involvement with Hanford issues, I have learned well not to trust USDOE. The claims that the grouting of these tunnels will not become permanent disposal sites cannot be trusted. Ecology must insist that these sites do not become permanent. Prior to the collapse of Tunnel 1, USDOE agreed that the Purex Tunnel Waste was to be removed, treated, and disposed in licensed repositories and landfills. It is essential for the state's permit to require the federal government to remove the grouted tunnel waste by a date certain. This waste remediation requirement and deadline should be added to the tri-party agreement. Thank you. Next is Ellen Ferguson, followed by D. Wake Knight. No. Okay, Ellen doesn't want. D. Wake Knight, followed by Richard Ellison. My name is D. Wake Knight. The last 30 years I drove a metro bus, but back in the era that would make me a baby boomer, I was born in Spokane. They call us downwinders, because there's winds that blow across this state. When the Cascade Curtain is absolutely, positively real. This side is a different world than when you're in the high desert on the other side. And as a dumb bus driver, I don't understand how you can fill a tunnel. Let's just pretend we're doing a sausage. And then when you cut it, nothing's going to leak out. All the radiation is just, it isn't there anymore. We don't want it. <laughs> I got some issues. Not a happy camper. I'm not going to go on forever because that's simply won't do any good. I also don't trust the government. 
being from Spokane, that helps a lot. <laughs> Please don't approve and say we got to do it because it's all there is. My entire life, as a grade school kid, I had to run home in case a nuclear bomb dropped. This crap ain't going away. We got to figure it out before we just poke at it with a stick because it'll bite you. Richard Ellison. Hello, my name is Richard Ellison. I live in Seattle, Washington. My address is on the sign-in sheet. Is that sufficient? I'm concerned about the soils beneath the tunnel, um, the fact that they have not been profiled and they need to be profiled, and the leachates, potential leachates and groundwater threats be monitored and evaluated. So I have questions as to why they have not been done in the past. Well, they haven't done anything in the past. So what can be done currently and what can be done in the future to monitor and evaluate any migration of materials uh, coming out of the uh, tunnels? Uh, number two, noting that lethal exposure can occur in minutes to humans who try to go uh, adjacent or into these facilities and the lack of any accurate investory of the materials, how can any materials be moved within any period of decades? So we're saying that these materials will be here for at least decades, if not 50 to 100 years or longer. The history of storage has showed many failed promises to fix the tunnels, and so how can we be assured that this next promise is really going to actually be fulfilled? Number three, how can the soils be protected from future potential leaks? Are there any soil barriers that can be inserted in underneath these tunnels? What can be done to minimize the migration of any materials that might leachate out of these tunnels until the materials inside, if they ever get moved? Slow down. Slow down. Are you getting this? Uh, OK. Four, what remote sensing can, as has been used in Japan in the reactors failures, can be used to evaluate the type and quantity of waste that are found in the tunnel, in the tunnel currently. Five, as there is currently no long-term permanent repository for high-level waste in the United States, how can these wastes be better stored until they might have the deep repository option available to them, aka if there is not a repository for 10, 20, 30, 50 to 100 years, then we are stuck with this tunnel at Hanford, and potentially this is a, this is a long-term problem. This is not a short-term problem. Six, as these wastes generate lethal exposure in minutes, and these wastes are high-level wastes with uranium, plutonium, cesium, strontium, and others, they must be moved to permanent long-term deep repositories off-site. They cannot remain at Hanford. Hanford water table is within 10, 20 feet of the surface. Um, climate change begs the option for the, the uh, water table to move, begs the option for increased rainfall, begs the option for um, large uh, storm events. Number seven, if the United States suffers an economic collapse, and money is not available for permanent off-site storage for 50 to 100 plus years, what is the best way to isolate the waste and to minimize human exposure? If the grouting is not sufficient to store things for 50 to 100 years, then what can be done to plan for and do per sort of semi-permanent storage until permanent storage is available? Eight, how might a peak storm event, a hundred year flood, a snowstorm, earthquake, affect the mobility of the waste with or without grouting? And what is the best options for planning for peak storm events, earthquakes, and other hazards? Number nine, should there be any legal accountability to officials from the Department of Ecology from both state and federal uh, State Department of Ecology and Federal Department of Energy in regards to their lack of action in the past as to why, if their promises were made, who made these promises or who made the decisions not to follow through with these promises. It seems to me that the State Attorney General's office has a requirement really to potentially at least investigate and look into the possibility that there should be actual charges filed. Thank you. My apologies on pronouncing this last name. Morgan Birchley. This will be followed by Mark Morris. Um, no, I'll just 
stand up. I was hoping that uh, Jad would have a chance to talk before me because he's really the the inventor. Yeah. Mm. I'm using the sign-up sheets. The order that what's. Well, that was, that confusion is my responsibility because there's nobody here, so I had cards out there. And then I didn't follow up with the individuals following. Everybody who wants to comment will comment. I'm taking it from the order. I have the pages, the numbers on the pages. Okay. It looks like. Yeah, I, okay. I just signed up like 20 minutes ago, so I must be like the last. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. You will when I'm on the mic. All right. Does everybody want to go in the order you think you have gone, but and I'll mark you off as you speak? Will that work for you, or do you want me to continue to go? No, I know that. I know that. I'm using. I'm using the sheets that people signed in on. I didn't realize that I didn't realize that there were more than one sheet that people were signing in on. That is my apology. I have I have a list of 23 names. of my life waiting for this moment. I didn't know it. This is the answer you're all looking for. Okay. Can, you, can, you, can you give us your name? I, and my name you. is Judd Hamilton. I was born in Republic, Washington. I was raised in Wenatchee Valley, upriver. I have many friends who died because of Hanford. 20 years ago, I came out of the entertainment business, okay? Not the science world. I began to realize that Portland concrete was a disaster for our world. It is an alkali, I, I wish the guy from CH2M Hill was here. It doesn't shield radiation. It can block it to some extent. And I became obsessed with finding a better concrete. I worked out on the peninsula with a high school friend from East Mon High. I came up with something that was a magnesium phosphate cement. I had no idea in the world anybody else was doing it. I studied the ancient concretes. Turned out that Argonne National Labs, the Department of Energy, was doing exactly the same thing, spending millions of dollars developing a chemically bonded ceramic phosphate, uh, phosphate ceramic cement. They invited me in in 2000 because I had my own version. I worked in their mandate, spending millions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money, was to encapsulate nuclear and hazardous waste. They invited me to come to Chicago because I was doing a similar thing off the street. I formed a relationship with the leading scientists in the world, Arun Wog, in this field, being paid by us, the taxpayers fellow from India, and he respected my work. Their encapsulation and my naivete was not shielding. It was simply to encapsulate these chemically bonded phosphate ceramics are the best concrete repair material ever known. They're under the radar still. They're studied all around the world in academics. I happened to find my own version. I went to a rune in 2004 and said, why don't you put radiation shielding material inside as an aggregate with powdered 
radiation shielding materials, iron oxides, burn, you know, there's many, bismuth, tungsten, many things. Arun said to me, the leading scientists in the world spending millions of dollars, Judd, that is a great idea. What? Why didn't you guys do it? Well, it wasn't our mandate. You should patent that, Judd. I'm a kid off the street. Not a kid anymore at that point. I did. I now have 40 world patents. I've taken that for 14 years because my children and grandchildren and your children and grandchildren and perfected it. Here's a Idaho National Lab nuclear radiation shielding test. And I will read you. I know five minutes is not a long time, but the final conclusion of hundreds of thousands of dollars of independently funded by myself and supporters, the gamma and neutron shielding and, and analysis and measurements were performed on an assessment of the characteristics of X-Rock ceramic cement composites and to, prov to provide a basis for developing shielding designs for spent fuel and radioactive waste. The validations measurements demonstrate the effectiveness of X-Rock ceramic cement composites for both gamma ray and neutron shielding. This is U.S. government studies. It's privately funded by us. That's why you can't... I am off to meet Rick Perry, the head of the DOE, in two weeks. I have seen from the inside why this isn't working because they don't, they've tried everything. It's not that they don't want to find solutions, not because they don't want to solve this. They've tried it. Vitrification, the grout we're talking about, I know very well. Portland concrete decays. It corrodes metal. It is one of our, right now, this material, this is, this is X-Rock, non-toxic, not one toxic material in it. It is four times stronger than Portland concrete. It'll be as strong as Portland concrete in three hours. We repair bridges and roads in Washington State right now with this. I so appreciate this moment. I'm not going to take a lot more time. We have a document. You can all have. We need to go to work now. A, and this is all government-funded evidence. Just an example. After I shared the idea with the with the Department of Energy and Argonne Labs. They didn't realize I was going to go ahead and do the patenting they suggested. They took $3 million and went to Russia to prove this stuff in 2008. I, CH2M Hill, I were part of that program. I contacted them, Daniel Smith, wherever you're at, CH2M Hill, very good guy told him that we need to work together, that I've got patents coming out, that this is an idea that I as a grandfather had come up with. Sent a letter, he asked me, to, and the letter ended up at the Office of Science, and one day I get a call. The next thing I know, the program at Argonne is closed down. Millions of dollars are sitting on this shelf with this kind of evidence ready to go to work to encap this not only shields, two inches of it shields everything, the entire electromagnetic field. It will bond to wood. It'll stop all the corrosion on the metal we're seeing here. It'll bond to the metal. But it also, in my last testing at INL, solidifies the nuclear waste. Nothing does that. This does. So I'm not going to take more times now. If there's more questions, we have some, but let's get it done. Answers have appeared that the, the, everybody is looking for. Nobody's against it. It's just that we're coming off the street. We're private people. We're not government, thank God, in the sense of how restrictive that is to people, good people that I work with in government, scientists. But everybody's handicapped. Everybody's looking for a way this is it. It's called X Rock. We have a, a nonprofit foundation called EchoC3.org. Thank you. It's not a commercial. Is this a serious problem, folks, or what? Mr. Mr. Hamilton, can you? No, we're Mr. Mr. a lot of failed answers. 
If you want to give more commentary, you can do it at the end. All right, I have three sheets here. Again, my sincere apologies for picking up the wrong sheet to start with. The first name I have on one sheet is Kathleen Saul, and the first name on the second sheet is Mark Morris. Do you know which one came first? All right, Kathleen Saul, followed by Jerry Paulette. I usually get nervous in front of groups, so I'm going to read my, my comments. We heard examples earlier of bridge and building failures. I'd like you to consider another example. Months after dropping deadly bombs in Japan, helping to bring a swift end to World War II, the U.S. military decided to continue its nuclear bomb tests in a remote, sparsely populated area of the Pacific Ocean, the Marshall Islands. A U.S. Navy commander told the people of the Bikini Atoll they would have to leave their homeland for the good of mankind and to end all wars. The islanders were given one week to inventory and pack up everything they owned. Officials surmised they'd be back within a year. Nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands came to a halt in 1958. In the late 60s and early 70s, cleanup work began. The U.S. Navy transported more than 110,000 cubic yards of contaminated soil from the island, twisted steel, slabs of concrete, and other debris to Cactus Crater on Renit Island. The waste was then covered with 358 concrete panels, 18 inches thick each, shaped into a dome 370 feet in diameter and 30 feet high. To this day, those islands remain unfit for human habitation. The Marshall Islanders started showing elevated risk of radiation-induced thyroid cancer and leukemia. Even so, in 1998, the U.S. government stopped funding medical care for those affected by the nuclear tests. Funds set aside by Congress to pay existing health and property claims ran out in 2009. Claimants have died waiting for compensation. I recount this brief history of the Marshall Islands because of the eerie similarity to events that occurred there and those occurring at Hanford. People given short notice by the U.S. military to vacate their property, to leave behind their livelihoods, to make way for a nuclear weapons program. Years of accumulated radioactive debris being dumped into large holes and entombed in concrete. People exposed to radiation from nuclear weapons programs dying as they wait for the U.S. government to fulfill the promises. In 1989, the, Department, the Washington State Department of Ecology, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and U.S. Department of Energy agreed to join forces to ensure that the environmental impacts associated with the past and present activities at the Hanford site would be thoroughly investigated and appropriate response action taken as necessary to protect the public health, welfare, and environment. All actions were required to be taken pursuant of the agreement to be taken in accordance with the requirements of all applicable federal and state laws and regulations. Yet, I stand here today because the U.S. Department of Energy wants to circumvent those laws and regulations and fill Purex Tunnel 2 at Hanford with cement, which they call grout, before undertaking a thorough examination and classification of the waste now housed in Tunnel 2, without investigating alternatives to grouting and without carefully considering the long-term implications of those actions. I'm going to skip that part. The U.S. Department of Energy now rushes to fill Tunnel 2 before identifying the chemicals and radioactive elements in the waste contained in that tunnel. The chemicals can include nitric acid used in the separation process, which can become explosive when reacted with organic materials. The Department of Energy has also failed to classify the radioactive waste in Tunnel 2. It has not isolated the high-level radioactive waste which, according to International Atomic Energy Agency, must be stored in specially designed facilities, preferably deep, stable geological formations several hundred meters underground. 
leaving that waste in bunkers eight feet below the surface is not sufficient to contain that radiation. A 2013 report published by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory confirmed that the t potential does exist for contaminated groundwater from the Runeet Dome to flow into the nearby subsurface marine environment. Cracks and splintering of that dome were identified during an aerial survey. Repairs are needed to reduce the potential for rainwater infiltration, possibly influencing groundwater flow and radionuclide migration to the subsurface marine environment. A follow-up 2014 study found that the radioactive isotopes from the Marshall Island nuclear tests have reached as far as the Pearl River in China. Grouting or cementing radioactive materials in the crater at Runeet has not proven, proven a stable solution to the problem of radioactive wastes, nor should it be a solution for Hanford's buried wastes. What is happening in the Marshall Islands can happen here. Do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Do not rush in to implement techniques we know have failed to protect us from the fallout of nuclear waste. Do the right thing for the people of Washington, the Yakima Nation, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, and the Wanapum Indians. The U.S. Department of Energy, Washington State Department of Ecology, and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency need to work together to find a real, permanent solution to the problem of waste from our nuclear weapons production and testing at Hanford. Thank you. Jerry Paulette, followed by Roxy Giddings. Jerry Paulette, Seattle, Washington, representing Heart of America Northwest, 15,000 members across the region. I'm not going to repeat some of the things I said earlier in the initial presentation, but I will start with this. Number one, collapse of the tunnel was expected, tunnel one. It was expected from 1980 forward. And Ecology issued an order in 1991 saying remove waste or new, have a new uh, stabilization study in 2001. Ecology chose to ignore that requirement despite the fact that the Hanford Advisory Board and others repeatedly said get the waste out, let's find out what's in it. And I'm going to come back to what's in it in terms of our comments because the Department of Ecology is not meeting its own RICRA requirements because it does not know what's in that waste and cannot legally issue a permit without that knowledge. So in 2016, Energy asked for a delay in all the actions around the Purex plant for cleanup, um, including delaying soil cleanups till the year 2040 and Many of you joined as members of the public in urging that that delay be rejected, including again saying get the waste out of the Purex tunnels by a date certain. Instead, Ecology said you must do a new stability study in 2017. And of course, Energy hadn't begun that study in May of 2017 when Tunnel 1 failed the study, rather dramatically. The Department of Energy has never wanted to remove the wastes, as we've said. And now the number one question is, are there alternatives to stabilizing the tunnel? Ecology does not have a single piece of paper in the record you adopted a tank closed waste management EIS section that deals with if you leave all the waste present in all the central plateau, here are the groundwater impacts that will exceed groundwater protection standards for 10,000 years as the cumulative impact of leaving the waste. That's not 
adequate for this determination and this decision, which is, are there alternatives for stabilizing the tunnel? You say that CH2M Hill had a group of people gathered together. There's no record of that for you to review or for us to review on the record. Did it include actual structural experts? Did it include removal of waste from the tunnel by a date certain? Because by heck, that is the most reasonable alternative for stabilizing the tunnel and being safe. And that brings us to the question of what is in the tunnel. The Purex tunnels we know were filled with process equipment straight out of the Purex plant without emptying the chemicals or even plutonium nitrate in many of the process vessels. Now, I don't know if there's anyone left at Ecology, really, who remembers red oil, tributyl phosphate, hydroxylamine nitrate, xylene, and an explosion in 1997 at the plutonium finishing plant. Blew the roof right off the plant in 1997 because energy abandoned chemical wastes in the building illegally without removing the waste from the process equipment. And those wastes self-concentrate. And the nitrates, plutonium nitrate, hydroxylamine nitrate, as was just mentioned earlier by someone else, um, act as oxidizers and cause documented, including at Purex, explosions. And they can be catastrophic. If you grout the waste, you have absolutely no clue right now if you will cause that waste to heat up to the 100 to 130 degree centigrade level at which it self-concentrates and explodes. You don't know what's in those process vessels. Ecology doesn't know, energy doesn't know. And the historical records are void. At the spring meeting, run by the Energy Department in Richland, Al Farabee is in the back here, acknowledged that we don't know the composition of the wastes, and once we grout it, we will never know the chemical composition of those wastes. Five you minutes. cannot issue a RICRA permit when you don't know the composition of those wastes and you have no reasonable assurance that they will be removed unless you put in an order that the waste will be removed on a reasonable time frame and secondly, you require an analysis of the alternatives to be in the record for you to review, the director of ecology to review, and for the public to review. We do not have that today. And without it, an appeal to the Pollution Control Hearing Board is inevitable, and it will succeed. Thank you. Roxy Gildings, followed by Bill Giddings, followed by Kathleen Allen. I'm Roxy Giddings. I'm from Tacoma. I'm very glad I'm from Tacoma on this side of the mountains. I could be a downwinder from Satsup. I could be a downwinder from Skagit, or yeah, Skagit. Um, anyway, out on we tried to build these nuke plants in a couple other places, so we could be downwinders here. Wouldn't we be lucky? Well, I am a downwinder. I lived in Pasco for nine years, and I was a downwinder the entire time, uh, going through puberty, which is an interesting idea. Uh, my dad died of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and uh, my sister had breast cancer, and has recovered and is still alive. And uh, so we feel like we're, we're lucky in a way, uh, you can't tag this radioactive stuff. Um, I think that the tri-party agreement is a farce. Every time I get one of these things from the Department of Ecology, I don't do email, so they send me this nice, lovely thing, which has the pictures in it of the tunnel, which blew my mind. Um, I am grateful for this too, but uh, during the during the war, there were about 250,000 people that came to Hanford. Half of them didn't know what they were doing because they didn't know they were building bombs that were going to 
kill people in a city or two. And uh, I think we're still at war. I think we need to be at war against radioactivity and we need to find a way to get in underneath these tanks and these tunnels and all this stuff. And if we hired 250,000 people and put them out there at Hanford, I have a, a, a cousin who is uh, even older than I am. Five and minutes. I've, and uh, I'm, I'm done. Have I talked too long? Um, anyway, uh, she thinks that if we really went to war, that we could probably come up with an answer to at least get this stuff taken care of deeply down. We can't build a tunnel, uh, we can't build a, a great big place at Hanford that's a big underground place because the way the, the rocks come together, if you hit the wrong one, it's like a, a letting a log jam go. If you get the wrong rock, the thing can implode all over the people that are working down in the hole. And, uh, and it's just like on a river, if you hit the wrong log, you can let the whole thing go down the river at one time. So um, we can't do that. We did, did build a big place in Utah, which got uh, stopped because we had a legislator who had some power and uh, so we didn't put the stuff in the hole in Utah that we made in a mountain and we spent, I don't know, a billion bucks probably, but we've already spent a billion bucks on this Hanford thing. It's easy to spend a billion bucks now. So I just, I would like to say that uh, I think we should go with Heart of America Northwest and their ideas because they know more about it than anybody else. It was through them that I found out we had like 40 trenches, 40, 40 miles of waste in shallow trenches at Hanford and they don't know what's in those. You know, every single person that worked at Hanford was probably at least 20 years old in 1945. So figure if any of them are still around. I'm so old, I'm old enough to belong to the the raging grannies. When I started this, I was too young. They wouldn't let me join. So if you don't know what the raging grannies are, you're young. So I'm not going to take a lot of time. But I worked for Heart of America back in the 70s on the telephone, calling people saying, can you contribute to the effort? And since that time, I have seen nothing but obstruction from the Department of Energy. I don't know about the Department of Ecology, State of Washington, but nice to see a woman in your position of authority being stood up to have to say to us, I don't know, I'm sorry, we appreciate your comments, but I don't know what to tell you. You know, maybe the people who are responsible for this could stand up and say that to us, but they probably don't have the wherewithal to do it. We could call it courage. Anyway, I don't know, we are the little people. We are the surface dwellers on this planet, and I don't believe that we do know what to do. And it's a constant, it's a constant exploration and a constant challenge to try to come up with something new, like the idea that your, that your fellow brought forward is probably a worthwhile consideration instead of just plain old mid-range grout. But the question I have with our friend over here is, you know, who is, who is obstructing this process? Somewhere or another, every time the government says, every time the, the, the population says, we get up and say, fix it, the, our legislature votes for it and says, fix it. It's written into law, something that's supposed to be enforceable, saying, fix it. And again and again and again, it's either defunded, delayed, disrupted, somehow or another, it doesn't get done. And I'm going, well, then maybe it's not supposed to get done. You know, maybe we just should quit making babies. Quit thinking that we are so powerful as individuals that we know what to do or how to do it. That self-government by the almighty individual is not an option for the health of the world. And that maybe, um, maybe God is watching. You know, maybe someone is aware and paying attention to what every one of us is choosing to do about these issues. And maybe that's where I have to leave it, is it's on every one of us to make the choices that will serve life and health and sanity and make room for the universe to let it happen.
I, I don't know what else. I think we're wasting our time with all these debates and conversations, except it gives us the feeling that we've contributed, that we've made a statement, that we've somehow taken part in a process that's going to have an impact. And it all goes into the mix. It's all part of the grout that we're using to sort of encase our process. You know? <laughs> Anyway, that, that would be it. Nothing, no positive suggestions, just let's quit making babies and prepare to die, because that's what we're here to do in the first place, okay? And live along the way. So what are we doing with it? Okay, that's all, I'm sorry. Jan Fitzpatrick, followed by Donna Van Norman. Okay, you're Donna? Is Jan still here? Myron Waybright, followed by Nancy Morris. Myron Waybright. Nancy Morris. Okay. Devin Murty. Devin Murty. Okay. Kathleen Saul is. You're on here twice. Okay, S Sylvia Haven. My name is Sylvia Haven. I live in Seattle. When I retired 27 years ago, I thought I was going to live the life of Riley and while away my time. Instead, I've come to, I don't know how many of these, to try to keep our government on the right track to do the right thing. But instead, I find they believe in magical thinking and that we can fiddle around and postpone permanent solutions on and on. And I'm afraid I'm going to leave this life before they clean it up. But I guess if I want to stress one point, the one thing that impresses me is that we need to find out what's underneath the tunnel before we go ahead and do anything else. The Columbia River is in peril. Mark Morris, followed by Richard Freith. Hello, my name is Mark Morris and I live in Seattle. And uh, as a citizen, I would like to voice my opposition to grouting uh, the Purex tunnel in place. And I think there are a lot of reasons to do this, uh, to, not, to not grout it in place. Um, uh, the numbers that, that have, have come out, uh, 43,000 square feet, if I got that correct, um, it just does not seem um, like it makes it so that it's going to be removable. Um, I don't, it does not sound at all like there were any provisions to keep the lychee from coming out of the bottom of the waste and leaking into the Columbia River, which seems to be a really major aspect of the project that was completely overlooked. Um, and um, I would like to see more studies uh, taken to uh, deal with that issue, that major issue. Um, and also, I feel like that's illegal as a result uh, because their their job was to make sure that the uh, there there is some way to remove that waste and uh, also if we do not know what's in the tunnels then it's it's illegal for it to to be there permanently because if there's plutonium in there and it sounds like there is then um, it's illegal for it to be stored permanently and it feels like there's just a subtle nudge towards making it permanent by grouting it in place. And um, it feels like that's what's going on here. And so I vehemently oppose the grouting project. Richard Freith, followed by Tom Carpenter. Good evening. I won't take long, but I will make some of the same points that I've made at the bit earlier. Uh, can you state your name, please? My name is Richard Frith. I am from Seattle. And I am also opposed to the grouting to come up with a temporary fix. 
what we're doing is we're pushing a, a problem further down the road and not addressing the problem. Uh, we have a limitation of mitigation options by grouting it. We still don't know what's in there. It's been going on since the 1940s. Uh, we've had 70 years of this problem here. We've had plenty of time to recognize there's, a one, there's one hell of a serious problem here, and it's been kicked down the road by generations. We can't continue doing this at this particular location. Maybe stick it in Nevada, maybe somewhere else. This is one of the largest rivers on the continent. And we are putting contamination in the ground that will affect us long after this nation is gone. We have international treaties with the Indian tribes that are, we are violating those treaties. How can anyone expect the United States to follow any international treaty? We've, we know there's a problem, we've known it, we've known it since most of us were ever born. If, if this is permanent, if this is grounded in place, it's, it becomes permanent by de facto. It's, we're gonna, the obvious intent is to leave this deposit here forever in a fractured basalt near one of the largest rivers in the nation. You, the water can move a half a mile in hours in these cracks underground. This, the, the leeches, we're not talking about something that'll take thousands of years. It moves very quickly. If this is the permit for Hanford, then this will become, by default, the permanent storage area for the entire nation. We've got one area that's already screwed up. Let's screw it up with everything else. Then we're re eliminating a major river and the land here, the food here, the drinking water, the fish, the irrigation, the recreational uses for all time and eternity. We don't have that right to do this. And the Washington Department of Ecology has to tackle this problem. We can't push this down the road. I did, I did the real estate with the city for 20 years. Uh, and the, some of the problems that we dealt with there in the Seattle Parks Department, I could look back at the records and the same problem was there in the 1950s, it was there in the 1930s. I could see what happened with the sheriff's deed back in the uh, early 1930s and the problems were there even before then at the turn of the century. These problems don't go away until you handle them. And this is a problem. You see the problem. You're hearing all these people talking about it. It's been going on since uh, most of us are running around in funny looking pants. We have to deal with this we just need to say no to this permit, flat out. We don't, we don't go into the crowd, we fix the problem. I can't build a rendering plant in the middle of downtown Fremont because I want to. There's a permitting process that stops me. You have a process, a permitting process. You have to say to the Department of Energy, the military, no, you can't leave it alone. You can't kick it down the road. We have to, this is the time. So please help us, help the people of the state, help the other nations that are here, and help the generations that will be here seven generations later and 70 generations later. This isn't gonna go away. It has to be fixed now. Thank you. Tom Carpenter followed by Larry Brand. My name is uh, Tom Carpenter, and uh, I'm executive director of Hand for Challenge. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit organization uh, that is a watchdog over the Hanford site. And uh, so I will admit to, uh, you know, having approached this issue with some qualms. Um, there was a partial tunnel collapse in last spring and in 2017 and uh, you know I think we are risking another tunnel collapse uh, I'm not sure there are good options out there uh, and I think we can you know look at why that is and how that came to be etc uh, I think the decision has been made to put grout in this tunnel 
Uh, I think that uh, the Department of Energy uh, has come up with uh, this solution. I, it's made the decision. It's let contracts. Um, it will probably happen even before the comment period is over. Um, that is, uh, I, I think we're just going to have to accept that. And, and I, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, the government will go forward with it. Uh, so just being realistic and knowing what happens at uh, when government has to act and is going to act in this. Um, what worries me, and you've all heard it, um, uh, at the Fernald site, the government um, took down all the buildings at the site and left highly contaminated soil and groundwater, and that was success, and it walked away. Um, and is still contaminating the groundwater there. In Colorado, at Rocky Flats, the government knocked down the buildings, poured in concrete and some of the underground buildings, and called it a wildlife preserve. And it's highly radioactive. Um, they called that a success. Uh, why? Because the Rocky Flats cleanup was going to cost $34 billion dollars Guess what? It ended up costing seven billion. So now we know the metrics that the government uses to declare what a success is. Uh, at Hanford, it's not just the Pure X tunnel that will be crowded. They want to use concrete to put into nuclear waste tanks, still holding high-level radioactive waste. Uh, they would like to relabel that waste and say it is not high-level waste anymore. They want to relabel waste that's been spilled into the soils that's high-level waste and say it is low-level waste and walk away from it. Concrete is the answer that they are foisting upon us. In the case of the PRX tunnels, I think what we have to make the Department of Ecology do and the Department of Energy is commit to making sure that there is a time certain when this waste, when this grouted waste will come out of the ground, that it's cut up and disposed of properly, et cetera. I think in the end that will be very expensive and very difficult and we'll probably have some problems. I don't think there is much liquid in these tunnels. Uh, Alex said there was not much liquid in there. Records don't indicate that. Um, so I don't see the same issue as with the tanks, uh, with contaminating the soils beneath um, uh, the tunnels as what we've, we're seeing, although we don't know. Uh, we just don't know, but we do know that they have put cameras down there, et cetera. Uh, so it's not an easy issue. It's not black and white. I think the tanks are black and white. Uh, I think this is a harder issue because if we woke up tomorrow morning or in the six months and Pure X Tunnel number two has collapsed and there's radiation flying all over Eastern Washington because of that, that's not a good thing, folks. So there has to be something that is done and I'm not hearing better answers right now. So uh, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not so clear to me as don't put concrete in, but let's not put ourselves in this position again. Uh, and let's not let this happen with the nuclear waste tanks. Thank you. Larry Brandt, followed by Harry Stern, followed by Morgan Beershank. Thank you for letting me testify, and thanks for sticking with the program so long. Um, my name is Larry Brandt. I live in Kathlamet, Washington, which is on the banks of, of the um, uh, Columbia River near um, Longview, Washington. Uh, my wife and I retired down there um, from my engineering career, and uh, uh, we've been living by the by the river and concerned about Hanford ever since. Um, I wrote some notes because my short-term memory is about that long, and I um, can't read my writing because my hand shakes so bad. Um, I don't know um, if the the um, contractor in the Department of Energy is correct um, filling the the tunnels with with um, grout. Um, I do know as an engineer that 
that grout and concrete are, um, are pervious structures. Um, liquids and some solids will float down and gases will float out. And in the case of, of the proposed uh, project, there's, um, there's materials there that'll do both. There's, there's radio, or, um, radon uh, that can escape and, and any number of, of soluble um, compounds that can float down. Um, my concern um, is not so much with the technology and with the grouting, um, but rather the behavior of the Department of Energy and, and the lead contractors for eons past at Hanford, whether it's Bextel or CH2M Hill or the previous guys, they don't, they don't, um, they make promises they can't keep. Um, people that follow, um, when one contractor finishes, somebody that follows up says, well, we didn't make that promise. Um, some examples, well, um, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, Department of Energy and the contractors, I, I think as a person that's tried to deal with them, they seem to treat me with disdain. Uh, I, I just don't matter. And I, I understand that because I tend to, to want to do my job and have everybody get out of the way. But they're, in a, they're not in the business to, to do a little job in one place. They're, they're protecting people's lives by doing this. Um, they withhold information. Uh, I learned last year, late, I think November, that, well, I didn't learn this, I knew this. Um, Hanford's getting a billion dollars a year for cleanup. And the proposed cost of cleanup is $101 billion. So Hanford, the project's gonna last 101 years if, 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 this, is, um, if this stays like this. Um, uh, the, the contractor in DOE um, asked for a delay on one portion of a project, and I won't go into that, but um, uh, Ecology asked them uh, how long a delay, and they said, well, we don't know, but we'll give you the answer in 2039. Well, I, I just don't, you know, so from a political um, perspective, I don't trust these guys. Once there's grout over the, the um, um, tunnels, they're, they're permanent. In my mind, they're permanent. Now, I, um, I didn't have, well, I had a little experience in, in this area in addition to engineering. My, I have two um, advanced degrees, one in physics and one in bioengineering. The physics degree was atomic physics, not nuclear physics, atomic physics. But my thesis for um, bioengineering was to try to develop chelating agents that would remove strontium-90 from kids' bones and from milk. And the determination was that strontium is so close to calcium that you can't get it out of kids once it's in there. And, um, you know, that caused me a lifelong concern over, over just the, what we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Harry Stern, followed by Morgan Beershank. Hi, my name's Harry Stern. I urge the Department of Ecology to set a deadline for um, taking the, the grouted waste and finding a permanent uh, place to uh, deposit it. Thank you. Morgan Beershank. Yeah, I just, um, grout is not grout and concrete is not concrete. Like there's different, uh, foundationally different chemistries and some of these chemically bonded ceramics are really covalent and ionic bonding and highly crystalline. And it's a, really, it, it bonds to itself so you can spray it on multiple layers. And, um, you know, Judd is, uh, extremely emotional because you know 20 years of basically working for these solutions understanding the technology but he's really working with like 
Paul Lessing and David Anderson. People have been at the DOE for 20 or 30 years and really understand these chemistries deeply. And maybe there's some kind of way that um, we can propose new solutions through a little bit of a backdoor kind of thing somehow. <laughs> but it would be nice to, to talk about some other solutions that involve these much more evolved chemistries. I mean, Portland Cement was 1824 was invented. There's um, better solutions out there that we can look at. Thanks. Is there anybody I missed? Is there anybody else wishing to give testimony at this time? Going twice? If you would like to send the college written comments, please remember they are due by September 27th, 2018. We accept written comments in the following ways. Here at this hearing, here at this hearing by mail, online using our online comment form. To get instructions on how to comment by mail or online, please pick up the flyers at the back of the black table, the table you entered this facility in. This information is also available on our website, or you can contact Diane at Dana McFadden. All testimony received at this hearing, as well as the first hearing last week in Richland, along with all written comments postmarked no later than September 27, 2018, will be part of the official hearing record for this proposal. Ecology will publish a response to, to comment document when the final permit is issued. A copy will be available to be downloaded from the Ecology website. Now I'll read this. It's the same one that's posted up on the screen here, but I'll read it since it's on the script. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash ecology dot wa dot gov forward slash waste hyphen toxics forward slash nuclear hyphen waste forward slash public hyphen comments hyphen periods. The next step is to review the comments and make a determination whether to accept the proposed modification. Ecology will consider the proposed modifications, staff recommendations, and public comments and will make decisions about approving the proposal. If we can be a further help, please do not hesitate to ask or you can contact Dana McFadden or Stephanie Schleff if you have other questions. On the behalf of the Washington State Department of Ecology, thank you for coming this evening. I appreciate your cooperation and courtesy. Let the record show that this hearing is adjourned at 2116, that's 916 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, September 5th, 2018.